Welcome to our third lecture covering the legal construction of the employment relation, excuse me, the employment environment. I'm going to um, fast forward to the hiring section. So we, we covered in the first lecture the recruitment of appropriate candidates, and then we talked about the testing section. You may recall both of these were designed to move us from the theory that we've learned in previous modules to the practice, what we actually do um, on the ground with the employer. What, what steps should the employer be taking to put the theory into practice. And now we're going to move on and talk about hiring. And so I'm going to fast forward to slide 101. You may want to pause me here so you can get to the right slide or the right section of the study guide to follow along. This is a long chapter. Um, most of our chapters aren't going to be this long, so um, this won't be something that we'll be seeing every time. You can see here, we've covered recruitment of appropriate candidates, we've covered testing, and now we're ready for the hiring topic. Hiring and promoting, making the decision. So we're gonna look at what types of factors should we consider in making those hiring and promotional decisions. We'll discuss interviews and we'll talk about the process of offering and accepting employment. So, what should we think about when we are trying to decide which candidate to accept? Um, uh, an employer does not have the right to raise a question during a, regarding gender in a job interview unless gender is a bona fide occupational qualification. Um, and most of the time, and they're not going to be. Uh, there may be jobs that are historically held by people of a particular gender, but it's pretty rare for that to be what's called a BFOQ or bona fide occupational qualification. Um, this would fall into the category of situations in which um, th there's a biological aspect. For example, let's say I wanted to hire uh, somebody to nurse my child. Well, obviously the person would have to be a lactating woman. Men don't lactate, so therefore uh, a BFOQ for that position would require a woman. Or let's say I wanted to hire a sperm donor. Well, I couldn't obviously ask for a woman to do that. It would require a man. Let's say I wanted to hire a, a person to play a particular, uh, let's, say, let's say I was doing a movie about Marilyn Monroe. I would want to hire somebody to play the role of Marilyn Monroe. That person obviously would have to be a woman, a woman who looked like Marilyn Monroe. And so that would be a BFOQ for that position. There are also some additional BFOQs that extend beyond those kind of obvious categories, and these oftentimes relate to things about modesty or um, things along those lines. For example, uh, a fitting room attendant who might be assisting people who, when they are not dressed, or um, a uh, mammographer or something along those lines. Those would be positions that uh, the customer might not be comfortable having a person of another gender assist them. Usually customer preferences is not a basis for a BFOQ, but when we're talking about modesty issues, uh, the law is more uh, open to that possibility. Okay, so employers that base hiring and promotional decisions on protected class characteristics obviously are engaging in disparate treatment discrimination. That's going to be unlawful. So if I were to say, um, let's say you had two candidates for a kindergarten teacher role, you might think, well, gosh, I think most of the moms and dads of kindergartners are expecting to see a woman in that role, and they may be uncomfortable with a man in that role. Uh, some people have ideas that somehow or another uh, a male kindergartner teacher might be a pedophile or something along those lines. And so there might, you, one might get some pushback from parents if uh, you're the principal of a school and you assign a, kinder, a, ma a, a male instructor to be a kindergarten teacher. But being a female is not a BFOQ for a kindergarten teacher. Uh, certainly a uh, teacher of any gender who has a history of pedophilia or inappropriate uh, interactions with children would not be eligible, but to assume that a male would be more likely to have it um, would not be uh, legally appropriate. 
Um, if an employer says, well, gosh, we have to have that protected class characteristic under these circumstances, um, even though it might be a disparate treatment, uh, the BFOQ is an exception to that policy. Um, it, the, and, and so this, this, again, that limited defense would be a bona fide occupational qualification. If the employer can establish that a BFOQ applies, then the practice of using that is legal. Um, an example of a, um, um, Another example, because BFOQs don't apply just in the gender area, but you could have a BFOQ about a religion. Again, the classic example is a kosher a food service. Um, obviously, the, 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 let's say it's a butcher shop. Uh, the butchers who actually slaughter the animals and uh, cut up the, uh, the meat don't have to be of the Jewish faith, but there has to be someone who um, certifies that the food has been prepared in a kosher manner. And for an observant Jewish person, that person who certifies has to be a Jewish rabbi. Um, even though somebody who isn't Jewish could learn all the rules that have to be followed and could comply with those rules as fully as, a, as the Jewish rabbi could, but part of the kosher certification process has a religious component, and that's something that only a Jewish rabbi would be able to accomplish. And as a result, then, um, a, 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 a a, uh, a meat processing facility that is trying to uh, obtain a kosher certification would have to have at least one uh, rabbi and therefore at least one Jewish person in that position. Race can never be a BFOQ, but as we've established, uh, gender can be as well as religion. Age can also be a BFOQ. Um, for example, for certain airline positions, people over a certain age are barred from having that for commercial airlines. And so obviously American Airlines can't be uh, required under the law to put um, somebody who is too old into that position, even if the airline thinks that person could safely perform the function, because that person would not have the correct license because of his or her age. And so that would be a BFOQ relating to age. Let's consider IRCA. IRCA stands for the Immigration Reform and Control Act. And this means that uh, the IRCA has lots of different components to it. Uh, the most important one that we deal with most frequently with respect to IRCA isn't really relevant here. And that is the aspect that says that you have, have to, within three days of the employment of a person, the employer has to get a completed I-9 form from that person, and that form will establish that that person is eligible to work in the United States. But that's not why we're thinking about uh, IRCA right now. IRCA has another provision that says that employers can't prefer U.S. citizenship as a general uh, a rule. Um, uh, can't um, can't discriminate against people because of their national origin or can't discriminate against the fact that that person isn't a citizen of the United States. Now it is true under IRCA that if you have two equally qualified uh, candidates, one of whom is a US citizen and one is who is not, in a tiebreaker situation, the employer is allowed to prefer the US citizen. But um, if there's any uh, significant way in which the non-citizen is more qualified, then the employer has to pick the non-citizen. There are some uh, governmental positions that um, establish that the person has to be a citizen in order to have that particular position. Those do not violate IRCA. Also, uh, there are times that in order to have a certain type of security clearance, you have to be a U.S. citizen. Again, if the job requires that security clearance, then you can certainly require that that person be a citizen. So when you're considering requirements for the job, be aware that you just can't say, well, gosh, we're a patriotic company. We want U.S. citizens. Probably that's not something you're going to be able to uh, prefer. Uh, the Age Discrimination Employment Act, IDEA, says that um, employers can't use age if the candidate is over 40 um, as a hiring criterion. 
Um, some states uh, don't permit age to be a factor at all. For example, the state of Florida, you can't prefer any age. And in fact, there's no limitation. So in theory, this could even apply to um, candidates who are under the age of 18. Although I think that that's probably a, a bit of an extreme interpretation. But once the person is 18, certainly the employer in the state of Florida wouldn't be able to say, well, you're the best qualified, but because you're 18, we're not going to hire you. You're just too young. Now, of course, 18-year-olds are usually not going to have as much job experience or life experience as, say, a 25-year-old. So um, it's going to be difficult for an 18-year-old to uh, be su the successful candidate who can argue, well, I was the most qualified and yet I wasn't given the job. But it could be that a 37 or 38-year-old might be the um, uh, highly qualified and the employer doesn't want to hire somebody of that age but would prefer somebody in the 20s. Well, under the IDEA, that person would not have any kind of, uh, of uh, statute that they could use to um, challenge the decision not to hire them because they, the candidate, even though he's in his late 30s, is not yet protected by the uh, Age Discrimination Employment Act. Texas, however, uses the 40-year cutoff. On your 40th birthday is the moment that you get protection. Imagine for a second that I'm 39 years old and 364 days and my employer fires me. And my employer could very publicly say, listen, the only reason why we're firing you is because we don't like old people. And this is our last chance to fire you before your 40th birthday. And we know once you're 40, we won't be able to fire you because of your age. So we're going to fire you now. You might think to yourself, well, surely that would raise a claim under the Age Discrimination and Employment Act. No. While it is true that that would be a very stupid thing for the employer to do, um, it probably would not be unlawful. But I imagine that employer would get a lot of bad publicity, so I don't recommend uh, that to an employer. Um, other criteria that can be considered are um, things like um, uh, or need to, need to be aware of would be things like grooming requirements or weight and height requirements. Um, sometimes those can be a business necessity, um, but oftentimes uh, they are going to present some problems. Weight and height requirements can have a disparate impact on women if the weight requirement is high and the height requirement is high, or they could have a disparate impact upon men if the height requirement is low and the weight requirement is low. Uh, sometimes grooming requirements can have a disparate impact. Uh, they can affect uh, categories in, in a couple of different ways. For example, some African American men suffer from a skin condition in which if they shave, um, the the beard hairs on their face can actually grow underneath the skin, and it's a very painful condition, and it's also um, you know, uh, unsightly. Uh, so, so as a result, men who have this condition usually choose to have uh, a beard uh, to to so that the, the hairs are long enough that they're not going to become ingrown. And so, in that situation, an employer who says, "Well, you have if you're a man, you have to be clean shaven," uh, that employer would would likely have to make an exception, not for all African American men, but for African American men and other men because this condition may exist in other communities, but it's it's most uh, identified with the African-American uh, community. Anyway, those, uh, those individuals with a medical reason would need to be given an exception. Another category could be a religious observance. For example, um, people of certain religions have a, either a cultural or religious desire to have beards. And so uh, people of the um, Muslim faith and also of the Jewish faith may feel that they need to have the beard. Generally, employers would be unwise to require clean shavenness under those circumstances. However, employers would be free to tell a candidate, well, uh, I understand you prefer to have a beard, but if it's not based upon a medical reason or a religious reason, um, then you will need, if you want to have this position, you'll need to remove that beard um, in order to continue. Generally, um, height and weight condition, conditions related to height and weight are not going to be considered disabilities. Um, for example, somebody who is very 
uh, uh, short, maybe of a very small stature, I might be referred to as a little person or somebody who is very, very tall. Um, those conditions can cause health issues, and if a person is experiencing those health issues as a result of those uh, medical conditions, then they might have a disability. But certainly somebody who's just somewhat taller than average or somewhat shorter than average is unlikely to fit into those categories. Similarly with weight, many times a person who has either very slim or very large might have health issues stemming from that condition. But simply being of a particular body type is not likely to be considered a disability. So while it may have a disparate impact upon particular categories, men and women, it in and of itself is not likely to be held to be a disability. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the Americans with Disabilities Act. But before we go into that, let's talk about uh, veterans. Veterans and active duty military status can be treated as a positive characteristic um, when people are choosing between candidates. So you might say, well, this could have a disparate impact upon women because men are more likely to be veterans than women. And you're right that that could be an issue, but this is a particularly carved out exception to that category. And so therefore that uh, would be uh, difficult for a woman to uh, con uh, to uh, contest that successfully. Uh, we've already talked about how discriminating against uh, people who are recovering drug or alcohol abusers could violate the Americans with Disabilities Act. So if you had a blanket prohibition against people having those uh, in their background, that could be problematic. It becomes more tricky if you have a rule that says, well, we're not going to employ people who have convictions for DWI or have convictions for drug use. I would say convictions for dealing is probably a pretty safe a basis to exclude someone from employment. Um, usually it's best, and we'll talk about this in other situations, it's best to uh, restrict convictions to the last seven year period, not to look at stale convictions. But if it were in that last seven years and a person had a conviction, especially for trafficking or selling, it's probably going to be safe to use that as a basis for not hiring the person. But if it's simply use or possession, especially if it comes to light that this person has had a drug or alcohol problem and is a recovering uh, abuser of those substances, then that might run afoul of the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's probably best under those circumstances to look at the case law, to sit down with the, an attorney and to figure out kind of where the risk level is. And it may turn upon the particular job that you're hiring this person for. For example, if you're hiring this person to be a secretary, well, even if they have a relapse, how much damage are they really going to be able to do as a secretary? On the other hand, if they are a semi-truck driver, if they have a relapse, they could uh, injure, kill themselves or other people. And so you'd want to consider kind of the job responsibilities if you decide you want to uh, evaluate the risks associated with hiring a particular person. We'll talk about English only rules later on. Generally speaking, unless the job itself requires uh, English skills, it's a better practice not to require English skills. Uh, many jobs would, it would not be necessary for the incumbent to actually be able to speak English or any other particular language. Now it is appropriate to be able obviously to communicate with your employee in certain respects, but there's lots of different ways of arranging that. For example, you might want to, uh, maybe a family member would be able to act as a translator um, or perhaps the person has some English skills. Many times in these work environments there may be managers or supervisors who also are bilingual so those can be ways of communicating. It is appropriate though to have some system in place so that in the event of an emergency everybody knows what to do and there is some level of communication. Let's say there's a fire in the facility. Well, you'd want to have at least some words that everybody understood so that the, the people trying to escape from the danger would know which way to go and how to be safe under those circumstances. Um, but generally requiring people to speak English when it's not an essential part of their job is not considered a lawful practice. Also, and this is even more especially true, requiring employees to speak English during their break or lunch period is definitely problematic. Um, it, sometimes having a situation in which there's a uh, an area and a facility, maybe the lunchroom, where there may be different clusters of people speaking in different languages, sometimes it can cause uh, some tensions in the workplace 
one group thinks the other group is talking about uh, the, the other group. Um, but um, it would be unreasonable to say to, to some people, hey, you speak this language, your friend speaks this language, but we're going to insist that you speak English instead, even though it's not the language you prefer to use. Keep in mind during these times, they're not supposed to be working. And so um, a, a wise employer lets people speak the way that they feel is most most uh, uh, comfortable for them under those circumstances. Generally, accents are also not a basis for making employment decisions unless the accent is such that it makes communication uh, difficult. And again, customer preference isn't appropriate under these circumstances, again, unless the, the accent makes the, the language difficult to understand. So we've already talked about BFOQs a little bit, but let's just see what the elements for that affirmative defense would be. What does the defendant, in this case the employer, have to prove in order to advance a BFOQ? Well, um, the employer would have to show that only persons with that specified uh, class, for example, uh, women or men or people of that particular religion, can do the job. And also, and this is the part we haven't talked about yet, but the job as currently configured is integral to the operation of the business. It's not just kind of a, yeah, we like to do this job, but this part of it, but we don't really have to. It's kind of nice, but it's not essential. If it's, it falls into the kind of nice but not essential category, the court isn't going to approve the BF, approve the BFOQ even if the first condition is met. Let's consider this example of a potential BFOQ. So we have a company that uh, wants to hire a male as, and want to say that being male is a BFOQ for this particular position. And the position is a high-ranking position. What the company is saying is that the clients of this company would refuse to deal with a woman in this capacity and that many times in this industry deals are made in hotel rooms and she might, would be uncomfortable probably contracting business in a hotel room. Uh, but the bottom line is that this isn't um, a, a valid BFOQ. For, as we've said before, uh, client preference or customer preference is rarely going to be considered a BFOQ except in the situations of personal modesty. And so uh, the, the firm is just going to have to suck it up. I mean, obviously, if a male ends up being the best candidate, then that's uh, fine. But if the female is a better candidate, then the company will need to hire the female for that position. And of course, the business could be contracted somewhere else, maybe in a conference room in the hotel. So what are the grounds? Um, here are some commonly recognized grounds for BFOQs where the courts have said, yeah, this is fine. We said authenticity, an actor in a movie or theater role, for example. A public safety, having female prison guards in a female prison. Uh, if you had male guards there, there might be some concerns that there might be personal relationships that develop or there might be an increased chance of uh, rape or some uh, things along those lines. And so public safety could be a reason uh, for that uh, requirement. Privacy, we already talked about the privacy aspect. As we said before, BFOQs can never be the case with race or color. And color is kind of a subcategory of race, recognizing that uh, people of a particular race, the skin tones that people who ha share that race might vary, and that can, in some, some instances, result in discrimination, even amongst people of the same race. Let's consider the issue of sex plus. So this is when we're looking at gender discrimination, but not pure gender discrimination. Gender discrimination plus another component. Imagine that an employer has lots of women in a particular position, but it doesn't hire women who have preschool age children for example. Um, it hires men who have preschool age children and it hires women who have older children or no children at all. That employer could legally say, well, we don't discriminate against all women, so it's okay that we discriminate against this population of women. Well, that, I mean, they can say that, but that's not going to be successful. If you have a protected category and then you uh, uh, put another requirement in that category, but you don't put that other requirement on people who don't fit into that protected category, that's sex plus discrimination. The big case in this area is a Martin Marietta case in that situation. Um, 
the employer would not hire again the, the women who had preschool age children and the argument that the that the employer made was well uh, in our culture usually number one preschool age children tend to get sick a lot because their immune system is still developing and in our culture it's usually the mother who stays at home when there's a sick child we uh, don't want in this particular position to have somebody who misses a lot of days of work so we don't want to have um, employees who are women who have preschool age children. Um, while that analysis is not probably uh, completely inaccurate or is somehow not reflective of the culture, um, part of the reason for these laws is to maybe make some changes in the culture. And so the court said, no, that's not okay. An employer can refuse to hire probably men and women if they refuse to hire all people who have children under the age of five or whatever but the employer can't single out one gender and say well you know fathers who have children uh, who have children under the age of five will hire but not mothers that would be sex plus and so this is does not qualify as a bfoq <coughs> already discussed the weight and appearance generally speaking discrimination on the basis of weight is unfortunately very common but it's not a basis for a legal claim at this point unless it fall, uh, uh, becomes an issue of uh, disability status. And we'll talk a little bit about that in the Americans with Disabilities Act when we get to that particular section. Sex stereotyping. This is an area of the law that is really kind of evolving. The big case in this area is um, the Price Waterhouse case. In that case, a, a woman who had kind of a, a brassy, aggressive persona had been passed over for a promotion. And um, she felt that it was because of this kind of brassy, uh, uh, masculine, almost like persona that she had. Price Waterhouse had promoted several women that were of a more kind of feminine way of interacting. Uh, to the partner level, and it had promoted many men who also had this aggressive, um, brassy uh, approach to things. But it had never promoted a woman who had this aggressive, brassy approach. And so uh, Ms. Hopkins' position was, well, um, I am the victim of sexual stereotyping. If I were feminine and uh, more along those lines, then I might have been promoted. If I were a man with my personality, I might have been promoted. But I wasn't promoted because I was at that intersection of those two things. And so sexual, and the court, court agreed. The court said, yes, that seems to at least be a fact issue for the jury to decide. Uh, sex stereotyping can continue, or uh, the, the scope of this idea of sex stereotyping is still somewhat undetermined. Um, it is possible, and some courts have actually done this, have said, well, sex stereotyping um, could extend so that uh, categories such as sexual orientation and gender identity could ultimately be covered under that Title VII category. Other courts have said no, uh, sexual stereotyping is really limited to um, the expectations people have about the behavior of men and women without getting into gender identity or sexual orientation issues. At the current time, we haven't heard from the U.S. Supreme Court on this issue, so we don't know where they would come down. We do know that our circuit court in Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi, the Fifth Circuit, has not taken a position uh, beyond the Hopkins decision. So they certainly haven't included sexual orientation or gender identity as a covered category under Title VII at this time. Let's look at the scenario. So we have in our example here a retailer required female clerks to wear maternal looking excuse me, smocks while male clerks wore business attire. Now having different dress codes is perfectly appropriate, but when the dress codes involve um, a, a different vibe to them, either a, a, a different level of maybe uncomfortableness or a different communication of status, under those circumstances, they can qualify as discrimination. So if the retailer had said, a women need to wear a professional dress um, or skirt and men need to wear um, a, uh, a uh, you know, 
a suit or something like that, then the court would say, well, those are even. Those are the same level in terms of uh, formality, um, and so that would be appropriate. But here, the levels seem to be different. The, the clothes here are more designed to uh, communicate a family feel versus the men are dressed in business attire. And so that was held to be discriminatory. I do want to let you know that generally dress code cases are loser cases for plaintiffs. So for the most part, uh, plaintiffs are not going to be successful in that area. That doesn't mean that employers ought to ought not think hard about what their dress code ought to be, because it communicates things about the culture, both to the employees and to the customers. And so it may be that while these particular policies might be permitted, they may not be the most advantageous for the business goals of the organization. Okay, so let's consider a discrimination against caregivers. I already gave the example of Martin Marietta where the woman wasn't hired because she had young children. Um, caregiver, pro caregiver protection is not a separate category, but it oftentimes does fall under that sex plus um, aspects. Now again, if both men and women are discriminated against, that sex plus isn't going to fly. Um, so Caregiving in and of itself is not a protected class characteristic. Uh, it's really not under federal law. There are a few states, though, that do have some level of protection, but Texas wouldn't be one of them. The type of caregiving that we see here typically when it does come up would be caregiving of children or perhaps of aging or disabled uh, family members. Um, obviously, under the Family and Medical Leave Act, there can be some uh, uh, short-term assistance that the employee can be titled, entitled to uh, receive. Uh, but a person does not become eligible for the Family Medical Leave Act until they've been employed for at least a year. So when we're looking at making hiring decisions, FMLA does not directly apply, although it could apply in the promotion scenario. Another issue to seriously think about is, are we going to discriminate based upon the perception that a caregiver may not be as committed to the job as others? Somebody who's very involved, for example, in the care of aging parents or young children, um, the perception might be, well, this person isn't as career-minded. Um, and of course, that doesn't necessarily follow at all. An example would be a school psychologist, obviously a professional person who has a young child, um, that doesn't mean that he or she's not serious about um, advancement in his or her career and certainly it would be appropriate or inappropriate to ask him or her or her to space her pregnancies and obviously it would be inappropriate to deny her tenure based upon her family circumstance. Now let's imagine that the school psychologist uh, performs poorly in the job for whatever reason. It could be because she's not very competent or he's not uh, sufficiently knowledgeable. Um, it could be because he or she is distracted by the child. Certainly you can make employment decisions based upon the actual work output, but whether the person does or does not have a child isn't relevant to the analysis and certainly opens up the employer to possible sex or sex plus discrimination claims. Um, oftentimes when we make hiring and promotional decisions, the employer is using subjective criteria. Subjective criteria is stuff that relies upon intuition, gut feelings, and it's hard to reduce to a clear statement. This is what this was what made us go with Bob versus Sally or Jane versus Peter. Um, and they are also the type of criteria that might vary. Um, what seems like Bob's gut is telling him is important may be very different than what interviewer Teresa's gut tells her is important. A subjective criteria is a very common mechanism, but it's a good idea to try to unpack it and say, okay, you have a gut that tells you we ought to go with candidate A. What about candidate A? Let's be as clear as we can to make sense of that. And of course, if you um, uh, are able to reduce it to a clear answer, then you can go through the other candidates and see, well, is the perception that this candidate is better? Um, if you go through and you can see, well, yes, he, he actually does have more education than all the other candidates. So now you have an objective standard that the interviewer might not have been able to clearly state, but once um, he or she is, thinks it through carefully, might be able to make that subjective criteria appear more objective. Now, 
one of the things that, that we, we hear about a lot in, in HR and also in the law generally in this area is that employers really care about some soft skills. Can this person communicate effectively? Can this person be a team player? Is this person open to differing perspectives? Those things are pretty soft and they're pretty fuzzy. They're pretty imprecise. And so it's hard to uh, categorically say to somebody or to say that Bob is going to be a better communicator or more open to diverse perspectives or things like that. Um, it, it, the, there's no test that you can give. There's no particular line on the resume that you can point to to establish that. And so uh, I, I don't want you to leave this thinking that subjective criteria can never be used but be sure to make it as clear about what made you draw the conclusion that this person had the skill versus that person. Um, that's going to put you in the better position. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples. One example would be the pass rate for female candidates interviewed for pilot positions was 28%, while that of males was 46%. That would be indication that there is some adverse impact here in however that interview process happens. I mean, it could be that just the female candidates were overall less qualified. So you'd want to make sure that uh, the levels of qualification were the same. But it could be that maybe most of the candidates, I me, most of the interviewers were male. And maybe because when a male in this particular industry interviews a male, maybe there's a camaraderie level or, or some, uh, some connection is made that makes that, that uh, interviewer have that gut level feeling this is who I want, but it's really just a preference for a particular gender, which of course is unlawful under these circumstances. Let's consider another scenario. So we have a police officer. Um, they, the police officers in this department need to pass a test as part of their performance evaluation to get promoted. This is very common in both for police departments and for fire departments. It's recently discovered that female officers taking the test scored significantly lower than male officers. Um, as a result, obviously, of this lower performance on the test, it was much less likely for female officers to actually be promoted. Um, uh, this, the city's decision to use this test would cause a disparate impact to the female officers. Now, we've already established that we can't do race norming or gender norming under the Civil Rights Act of 1991, so the, the city can't fix the problem by continuing to use the same testing tool and just adjusting the numbers. But perhaps the city might want to develop a testing product that uh, has less of a disparate impact to female officers. So we're done with the topic of uh, the criteria that we ought to use for hiring and promotional decisions. Let's move on to the interview process. As we said before, uh, job interviews can be very subjective experiences. I've worked in the corporate world and I've also worked in some government positions or at least facilitating government employers in certain situations. And so I've, I've been in environments where the interview was really a free for all. Uh, the interviewer could ask really any question other than unlawful questions. And uh, I've seen interviewers that have, you know, come in with the, their list of questions very precisely asking the same question. I've had others that were very seated the pants and they might ask these questions interview one and then another set for interview two and another set for interview three they're all kind of contemporaneous and they kind of let the flow of the interview go where it will I've also been on in the situations where in uh, there were scripted questions and the uh, qu interviewer were not was not allowed to ask follow-up questions was not allowed to ask about particular thing in a particular candidate's uh, resume or application that were kind of screamingly obvious that needed to be addressed. So uh, while I've, so I've, I've really seen a, a range of this and it's important to know the, the, the culture of your organization to see where along that continuum it exists. There are challenges with both approaches. There's challenges with being too regimented and having very scripted questions because in, and sometimes in those cases, you the interviewer doesn't get the information he or she needs. And the interviewee is not always to blame. Sometimes the interviewee doesn't even realize what this 
is trying to get at. And because there isn't that back and forth, there aren't the follow-up questions, uh, both parties can end up feeling kind of dissatisfied by the flow of that particular interaction. At the other extreme, though, when you don't have any scripted questions, it becomes a very subjective process. And so it's very difficult to say, well, you say that Teresa seems to have more of the soft skills because when you asked Teresa this question, she answered it this way. Oh, but you never asked Bob that question. So how do you know how he would have responded? Well, you don't know. And that becomes problematic. So it's good to be aware of the dangers of both and to be familiar with where your organization is. Probably it's good to have some level of scripted questions that you cover with every single person, but that there's also some freedom to ask logical follow-up questions and to uh, have a, a couple questions that are designed to respond to particular things in that candidate's background. And again, at the end of the day, when you make your final decision, you ought to be able to articulate specific objectable grounds for why that person was not selected. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to tell that person. No, 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 no. I mean, you're only going to communicate that if that person files some kind of claim. So let's imagine for a second that I apply for a job to become a, a supervisor in the widget factory. And I don't get the job. Well, I might well call up the, the hiring person and say, hey, you know, thank you for the opportunity to interview. I'd really like to hear um, how I can do better next time. I was excited about the job and I realized I wasn't successful, but I would appreciate some candid feedback. Uh, a brave thing that I did by making the call, but of course, it's not a smart strategy for the employer to provide any specificity. The only time that you might be able to provide additional information would be if there's something very, very clean cut. For example, well, you didn't score high enough on this test. You needed to have a cutoff at least 80 and you only scored a 77 or whatever. But even there, I probably wouldn't volunteer the information because there's really no upside for the employer. Um, this person isn't going to be hired and so while we don't wish him or her ill, uh, there's really no benefit for us in helping that person out. So most employers would say, oh, well, we thank you for your candidacy. You just weren't the best fit. Thank you for your time. Click. Um, being specific could open you up to some exposure. So let's say you, you did say, well, the reason we didn't hire you was because um, you just didn't seem to have enough charisma or something like that. Um, well, the the interviewee might start thinking, well, maybe you didn't think I had enough charisma because I'm a different race than you are, or I'm a different religion than you are, I'm of a different gender than you are. And so by presenting very specific reasons to the candidate, you're kind of opening up the employer, you're perhaps giving the candidate a, a kind of a map as to how to uh, file a successful charge against the employer, not a smart strategy. Let's consider some questions that might be unlawful in an interview. Before we go through these, um, it's another reason why it's helpful to have scripted questions. Um, you want to make sure that even if you don't have scripted questions, that the people who are conducting interviews know the topics to avoid. As I said before, sometimes the most dangerous part of a job interview is the trip from the reception area to the place that you're going to conduct the interview, where you're making small talk. You're thinking about things and you're trying to find get to know the person on a personal level so you ask things like oh you know uh, where do your kids go to school or do, what does your husband do for a living what does your wife do for a living and you're finding out things about their personal life that really aren't a source of concern because you're just trying to find whether this person is a good match for the job you're not trying to become their new best friend so you want to avoid those topics um, and you want to train your interviewers so that they know to avoid those topics so things you don't want to talk about about our child care needs. Again, I use the example of JCPenney. Our great child care uh, facility was a big selling feature, so I'm sure that it was common during job interviews to talk about it because, you know, we were proud of it and we wanted candidates who weren't already aware of it to know that if they were offered a job, this could be a factor for them to consider as they decide whether to accept the job or not. But on the other hand, we certainly none of our business, whether they had children or planned to have children. And by going down that road, we could create the impression that we had an interest about whether they had children or not, which of course we didn't. Similarly, you didn't want to, we, we shouldn't ask about marital status and not just current marital status, but even past marital status. 
At one point at JCP, this is before I was there, but say in the 70s and 80s, a person who um, was unmarried would not move up the ladder. The, the perception was that a stable people were married um, and that somebody who was unmarried was maybe still kind of sowing the wild oats or something. That wouldn't be true today in most organizations. And I'm sure it wasn't, wouldn't be true with JCPenney anymore, but um, things like that could qualify as marital status discrimination. Now, marital status discrimination isn't unlawful under federal law and it's not unlawful under Texas law, but it could open you up to a sex plus claim. For example, if you care about the mar marital status of men, but you don't care about the marital status of women, that could be a sex plus situation. Your graduation could establish a person's age, and so it could create um, information that the employer doesn't need. An employer doesn't typically need to know whether a person is over the age of 40, but if you can do a little bit of math to figure it out, well, then you could be in a position to discriminate. Now, of course, it's pretty common for people in their applications or resumes to list the dates that they completed college or high school or whatever the particular situation is, and so the employer might already have that information, and that's fine, but the employers shouldn't actively seek the information. Oh, for example, and the way this can come up is, oh, I see you graduated from Miami State. Um, my cousin graduated from then. Um, what, what year did you graduate? And, and the only reason the interviewer is asking is to see if maybe this person overlapped with the cousin. Uh, there was no real interest in finding out the person's age, but you can see how the candidate, especially the candidate isn't ultimately successful, might think to himself or herself, ah, once they found out my age, that's when they decided they didn't want to hire me. So better not to ask those questions. Also, it's a better idea not to ask about person's kind of extracurricular activities, what clubs or churches or synagogues or uh, mosques the person might be uh, attending or involved with. That could point to cultural ties, um, ethnic ties, religious ties that, again, are not really relevant. Um, and so those are topics to avoid. You really ought to just stick to the nuts and bolts of the uh, job responsibilities. Let's look at a scenario here for kind of a flavor about how this plays out. So Aisha Saeed uh, was interviewing for a marketing manager and the uh, interviewer asks Aisha about the origin of her first name, asks her if she's married and if she plans to have children in the near future. Now, again, none of these questions are technically unlawful under federal law, but if Aisha isn't hired, um, then she could well say, well, gosh, um, uh, they, they seem to, to like the fact that my name has a Middle Eastern origin. They seem to not like the fact that I was married. They seem to not like the fact that I plan to have children in the near future or whatever the particular answers were. And so basically that interviewer has given Aisha some pretty darn good raw material to make up her claim of failure to hire employment discrimination. Let's move on to offering and accepting employment. What are the landmines that it can, can exist in that particular circumstance? It's a best practice to offer jobs in writing. Now I'm going to say that, but there's a couple of things I want to maybe put a little bit of a caveat to. Um, this would, certainly for management jobs, it would be a best practice. If you are in an industry where there's a lot of turnover and people kind of come and go, it might get to be a little bit silly giving letters uh, for every single time you hire someone. Uh, so I'm not going to say every single industry this is an expectation, but certainly if you expect this person will be around for, you know, several months, then this would be appropriate for you to go ahead and give an offer that is in writing. And it's good to have a form that you develop with your legal counsel. Um, and of course, you'd, you'd have the format and then you maybe fill in the blanks uh, with things like, you know, salary or hourly or wage information, uh, start date. Um, you're going to want to include employment at will. Um, that's an important thing. That's almost certainly going to be part of the arrangement. And you also want to explain what that is. Now, of course, you're, you're trying to, through this letter, persuade this person to join your employment. So you don't want to give too heavy of a hand in this area. Uh, so there's a balance there between communicating clearly what employment at will is 
versus also making the person think, oh my gosh, as soon as they come here, they're going to fire me for no reason at all. You don't want to create that um, impression either. So uh, you want to be artful about how you phrase it. And uh, you want to also perhaps talk about benefits and things along those lines. It's a good idea to have. One of the strengths of having a written offer is that if the uh, candidate accepts a job and later on says, well, I was told X, Y, and Z, well, you can pull up the letter and say, well, gosh, none of the things you're saying that were said to you are in the let offer letter. So why didn't you say something at that time? Wait a second. You promised me blah, blah, blah and it's not in this offer letter what's the deal with that and so it does help from that perspective um, if an offer is made and then withdrawn um, there can be some problems with that especially if the candidate has accepted the offer and then has uh, quit current employment so now this person is between positions in part because he or she thought that the offer of employment was going to go forward. Um, if um, it's an employment at will situation, as we said, almost certainly it will be, a promise of a job which is then revoked will usually not result in a valid claim, a breach of contract, except in the promissory estoppel situation. At least you can see this term's in red, so let's spend a little bit more time on this one. Promissory estoppel, let's look at the, these two words and kind of break them down. The first word is promissory. And I'm sure you can see the beginning two syllables are just the word promise. So there has to be a promise involved here in order to have promissory estoppel. No big surprise there. Let's look at the word estoppel. We can see in the middle syllable of the word estoppel, you have the word stop. So when, the, the idea behind promissory estoppel is that when the, the, the one entity makes a promise, the law may stop that entity from not fulfilling the promise. Now, promises are usually not things that the law is that interested in. Um, if you make a promise but it's not a contract, usually the court is going to say, well, I mean, you know, nice people don't break their promises, but the law isn't necessarily about being nice. And so the courts are usually not going to enforce uh, promises that people make maybe on a lighthearted basis. Um, if I were to say, let's say my grandfather were to say to me, uh, Groover, um, I'll give you a million dollars when you retire uh, or when I pass away. I'll leave that to you in the, in the will. But when I actually get the will, he's only left me, you know, his sofa or something. Um, could I sue the estate under that basis? Nah, I couldn't. Uh, the, the courts are going to say he changed his mind or maybe he was just making chit chat. But in any event, that's not going to be a situation where the courts are going to enforce promissory estoppel. But when we do see the courts being willing to enf enforce the contract would be when the person who was given the promise relies to his detriment on the promise and the reliance was reasonable. So an example would be relocating to a new area, buying or renting a new residence, uh, leaving a job that had a uh, long-term potential. And so those situations the court might well say, well, you know, yeah, this person was reasonable in his or her reliance, and he or she is out money as a result. And so the courts might be willing to enforce that offer, even though it was subsequently withdrawn, even in an employment at will situation. But that's a pretty difficult battle for that uh, almost employee to be successful at. Here are the elements of promissory estoppel on another slide. Let's consider the issue of promotions. Um, we have talked a little bit at times about the idea of a glass ceiling. That is the idea that it's hard for women and minorities to advance beyond a certain level in many organizations. And this can happen even when there is no intentional discrimination. But there's something about the culture um, in ways that maybe people don't even know quite what they are but that uh, allows uh, uh, Caucasian men to be more successful. Um, and so it's, it's a good idea for organizations, especially the HR department, to try to ferret out what are those roadblocks that happen with people uh, of, of various ethnicities and races and also women 
that somehow interrupts their progress within the organization. Sometimes it's certain career paths that seem to maybe be more likely to have men in it, that seem to be more likely to advance, for example. Another thing that can happen is informal processes for promotions and things like that. So an HR department ought to work to establish procedures that are followed routinely, virtually all the time, for promotions. It ought to be sure that um, opportunities are well publicized and that uh, interested employees are going to know about them and have the opportunity to actually submit an application. These are really good things to show kind of a level of goodwill so that um, promotional opportunities are available to everyone. And obviously men would be following these procedures and Caucasians would be following these procedures as well. So it wouldn't just benefit women and people of color. We already talked about the glass ceiling, but here's a definition. Uh, the Glass Ceiling Commission was established um, under the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1991. Um, the U.S. Department of Labor defines a glass ceiling in this way. Those artificial barriers based on attitudinal or organizational bias that prevent qualified individuals from advancing in their organization to upper management positions. And again, we're, when we're talking about qualified individuals, we're usually talking about minorities and women. Let's consider an example here. A successful completion of international assignments might be a prerequisite. Maybe it's a formal prerequisite. Maybe it's an informal prerequisite um, for advancement to, within this particular organization, to advancement to higher positions. But um, these international assignments go overwhelmingly to males. Well, maybe that either it ought to be communicated to women, hey, if you want to advance, you need to go into the international assignments, or perhaps domestic assignments ought to also be able to lead to the higher position. So there's lots of different ways of addressing these issues. Sometimes it's simply providing more information to potential uh, people that are affected by this, and then it's by changing the, the practices and the policies within that organization. So we have now completed the discussion about the hiring decisions. Um, we've talked about, again, in the first lecture, recruitment of appropriate candidates. In our second lecture, we talked about testing. And in this lecture so far, we've talked about hiring both, or actually the first part of hiring, making the decisions. And now we're going to talk about implementing the decision. OK, so we've decided who we want to hire. Um, now it's just a matter of kind of dotting the I and crossing the T. So let's talk about some issues that come up in this context. Background checks. This is a controversial topic. Uh, when should we conduct background checks? If we decide to conduct background checks, what positions and what standards should we use in this situation? Um, well, let's first of all talk about what a background check is. Um, it's a, a device used to verify information provided by candidates and to determine whether any disqualifying factors exist. This should be exist, not exit. I apologize for that. So things that you might do is check references. This is almost always a good idea. It takes time, and many of those calls are going to be unproductive because the person you're calling refuses to give you any meaningful information. So certainly employers sometimes don't do those checks simply because of you know, me having too much work, but it's certainly a smart way to do, and you'd want to do this certainly for positions that involve people who might be putting other people at risk because you can get into a negligent hiring situation. Um, and certainly people who are in uh, more senior positions within an organization ought to be subject to reference checks. It never, it never fails to surprise me how many times people aren't checked in these areas. Um, and this, of course, would be references, but also past employment, military service, confirming that the person has all the credentials that they claim to have. And this is relatively easy to do. You can just require transcripts from folks and require that they be the official transcripts. You can also check credit reports. We'll talk more about this in a couple minutes. And finally, you can check the online personas, go through their social media accounts, look at what they're posting in Facebook or what they're post on LinkedIn, what they post on Twitter and, and Instagram and other places. But we're probably going to spend most of our time talking about the credit report area. 
before we get too far into this though, let's talk about one of the big reasons why employers care about all of these things, and that is that doctrine of respondeat superior or vicarious liability that we've talked about in the past. And it turns on the fact that employers oftentimes are responsible for the actions and inactions that their employees create. And so if an employee does something bad on the clock, the employee is going to be responsible for it, of course, but the employer is going to be too. And that's especially true if the employer um, should have known or did know about something in the employee's background that made that employee more likely to engage in that kind of behavior. I gave the example in an earlier lecture about a potential employee who had been convicted of a, a sex crime with a child. If uh, the, the retailer had in fact hired that person to uh, be a sales clerk in that department and something awful had happened, it would be very difficult for that retailer not to have massive liability. And the massive liability would have occurred whether or not the retailer had known about the uh, behavior. Because it, even if the retailer had known about the conviction, uh, the jury would learn that the retailer could have learned about the conviction if the retailer had done due diligence, had done the criminal background check. So um, uh, responding at Superior is a big reason why many of these checks are, are completed. And I said before that um, the employer is responsible for the employee's actions while the employee is working. Uh, really the test here is the scope of employment because obviously when I'm at home off the clock hanging, hanging out in my house, uh, most likely the things I do um, aren't going to create liability for my employer. I mean, you know, if I'm convicted of some awful crime, it may come to light that I worked for this company or that company. So there might be some negative publicity, but there's not going to be legal exposure unless I was acting within the scope of my employment. Well, let's talk about what that means. Uh, the, and we see here three categories. The employee's actions relate to the type of work she was hired to perform. Um, they took place substantially within the workplace during work hours, and they serve at least partially the interests of the employers. We need to have all three of these things to be present for it to be within the scope of employment. Let me give you an example. Um, imagine that I am a loss prevention officer or a security guard in a target facility. I have no idea what target's rules are in this area, so I could be completely misstating it, but let's imagine that's my role. And let's assume that target's position is target doesn't hire, I'm saying here, I don't know if it's true, does not hire off-duty cops, hires just civilians to uh, be uh, loss prevention officers. And let's assume that Target's rule is that uh, once the shoplifter exits the store um, and is within five, uh, goes beyond five feet of the exit of the store, the loss prevention officer is not supposed to follow the uh, uh, shoplifter at that time. Okay, so let's assume that's a rule. Let's say that every loss prevention officer is well trained in that rule. They are repeatedly tested on it. Um, a loss prevention officers who break the rule, who go beyond those five feet, are routinely fired, and all loss prevention officers know this. Okay, so Sally is hired to be a loss prevention officer at Target. She's trained, she receives all that training about the rules, and she's on the clock one day, and she's doing what she's supposed to be doing, which is monitoring the store for uh, a shoplifters, and she's watching the cameras, and she sees somebody clearly shoplift, and so then she's going down to the floor to catch this person as they exit the store. Um, so she's, she's working within the workplace during the hours, the work that she's doing is to advance the interest of the employer to reduce the likelihood of shopholders to uh, shoplifters and to retrieve merchandise that shoplifters are taking. And her actions are related to the type of work that she is supposed to perform. The adrenaline is pumping. She's excited. I mean, honestly, loss prevention officers love this moment. Uh, I'm not going to lie to you. This is an adrenaline rush, rush for them. And so she's in hot pursuit of this uh, particular person whom she sure is shoplifting. Uh, she wants to catch him or her. Um, but this person's just a little bit faster 
uh, a little farther away than, than Sally is, and so she cannot reach this person within those five feet. But again, the adrenaline is pumping, and she follows that uh, customer out into, not well, shoplifter slash customer out into the parking lot. She's chasing him. She's gaining on him. They're now 20 or 30 feet in the parking lot. Um, a car hits the uh, the shoplifter. And maybe the shoplifter is badly injured. Shoplifter sues Sally individually as well as Target. Um, Target can say all at once, well, but Sally was supposed to stop at the five-foot point. We trained her. We told her. We fired her as soon as we found out what happened here. Uh, she definitely wasn't supposed to do that. She wasn't acting in her correct role at that time. But... She was serving at least partially the interest of the employer at that time. And the doctrine of respondeat superior or vicarious liability would absolutely apply. Sally was in the scope of her employment, even though she was breaking company rules. And so as a result, that shoplifter might well have a good claim against Target. Okay, uh, another way that uh, we've already kind of talked about negligent hiring, this is again going back to the example of the pedophile who might have been hired if the background check hadn't been completed. When employers don't do that careful background check, um, then or, and it might be a criminal background check, but it could also be just a reference check or looking at gaps of employment because after all, that gap of employment might be time that person was in prison, right? So negligent hiring occurs when there's an employment of a person who causes harm that could have been prevented if the employer had simply done a reasonable background check. Again, the pedophile who's hired who wouldn't have been hired if the criminal background check had been performed. Let's explore this term negligent a little bit farther. What is negligence? Well, negligence under the law is a failure to do something in such a way or manner as a reasonable person would have done. Let's pause here. We've seen the word reasonable before. Hopefully you remember that means objective standard. It's not what you as a quirky individual thinks is reasonable or that I as a quirky individual thinks is reasonable. It's kind of the average perspective in this society about what a person ought to do. It's going to change over time. What a reasonable person in 1950 would have thought about a particular situation is going to be different than what a reasonable person thinks about it in 2050. Uh, so it is culturally specific and, and related to the values in a particular moment in time, but it is a generalized take on the situation. Let's continue with the definition. Doing something that a reasonable person would not do would be negligent. Or failing to raise one's standard of care to the level of care that a reasonable person would use in a given situation. So if you act negligently in the hiring process, guess what? You're guilty of negligent hiring. This is a tort theory. We talked about defamation and the related uh, torts of libel and slander. Those are types of torts. We call those intentional torts. But negligence is also a type of tort, and it has a potential for some significant damages in the case where the employee, when the defendant, excuse me, the plaintiff is successful. And again, this is usually not going to be the employee who's suing. It's going to be the person that the employee is harmed. Okay, to state a claim, an employer, for, to state a claim against an employer for negligent hiring of an employee, a plaintiff, usually the person injured, must show that the employee was inappropriate for the position assumed. So again, the pedophile who was hired to um, uh, be a, a sales clerk. But let me give another example. Let's say that a, a trucking company hires a pedophile to drive its semi. And uh, the uh, employee falls asleep at the wheel and causes a big accident. Uh, but the all, and the, and the uh, trucking company had not done an effective background check. Uh, but being a pedophile doesn't make you more likely to fall asleep behind the wheel of a car. So even though this trucking company didn't know about the pedophilia, um, it doesn't uh, that failure to know that wasn't a factor in the actual harm that was done to this particular plaintiff. So that wouldn't have been a, a, a especially good fact pattern for a negligent hiring case in that scenario, especially since um, a pedophile wouldn't really have access to children driving a semi-truck. 
here's an here's a list of the elements or the things that the plaintiff has to pr prove in a negligent hiring case and then here's another um, uh, way of looking at those same elements um, let's see here let's just look at so to state a claim of negligent hiring the plaintiff must show obviously that an actual employment relationship did occur that the employee's behavior um, that there was a misconduct on the part of the employee that the employer should have known about um, the incompetence um, uh, stemming from uh, you know it could have known about it either through the interview process or the background check process that the employees inappropriateness caused injury to the plaintiff and that um, the employer's negligence in hiring or, or just keeping this person once they found out about the incompetence actually caused the plaintiff's injuries. And uh, another way of looking at this is um, during the investigation, the employer could have discovered the relevant information and prevented the incident from occurring. So he should have, the employer should have conducted an investigation. They had enough information to do so and they didn't. And that failure resulted in negligent hiring or negligent retention. And the investigation again could have been the reference check, it could have been the criminal background check, or maybe there was a previous incident that this employee did while being employed by the employer and uh, that the person should have been fired but wasn't and then the, another incident happened. Those could all be situations that could arise. So for most jobs, the degree of care required depends upon foreseeability. Um, so again, if you're a child care uh, worker, uh, then obviously it's really important that you be, be able to be appropriate around children. Um, and so that would be a situation where you'd really want to make sure this person doesn't have any history of crimes against children. If though you have a widget factory and everybody employed in the widget factory has to be at least 18 years old because of child labor laws, it's probably not so important. Uh, whether you hire a pedophile or not in your facility and so you have to think through how likely is this particular uh, this particular person's problem going to cause the employer a problem now let's imagine that uh, five years later uh, the uh, widget factory decides to open up a child care facility because many of its employees have young children well now it may not be appropriate to maintain the pedophile widget uh, assembly line worker in that facility given the daycare center. So that's a change in facts which now it's foreseeable that children could be at risk while previously it wasn't foreseeable. So let's talk about some things to be aware of when you are conducting background checks. Um, employers have different methods of doing it uh, the one that I am most familiar with has to do with the use of a matrix that was the term for it and, and when I worked in this area um, I hired a company to uh, uh, actually run the background checks and to give us the results of the background check and uh, it's actually a rather complicated uh, area of the law because there isn't a lot of consistency in how background checks or how that data bubbles up as you know most of the crimes that happen in the United States are state law violations there's relatively few federal crimes um, other than maybe some drug offenses that really are relevant in employment situation and so um, one of the first things that you do when you're doing a criminal background check is you're trying to figure out where this particular person would likely have committed a crime. You don't uh, search all every county and every state because that would be ridiculously expensive and it would be very very time consuming. So what you do is you see well what states did this, not just states, but what counties did this person live in during the relevant time and you want to search the records in those counties. Now it could be that Bob committed crimes in um, uh, while he was on vacation in other parts of the country or maybe he took business trips and he committed crimes or he might even be convicted of crimes so this system is not perfect but again it, it would just not be possible to 
look everywhere for these types of issues. So usually there's a system of checking either the county where the person lived or the county where the person worked or possibly adjacent counties um, to find the records. Even in those cases though, not all counties have all their records online going back far enough. Um, it could also be the situation, especially with uh, women whose names have changed either through marriage or the divorce that the records might not be completely up to date. And so there can be a additional factors to consider. Then you have to consider, well, what types of, of convictions are going to be relevant? Um, most people have some kind of conviction. It might be a speeding ticket. It might be a parking ticket. It might be a jaywalking ticket. Most people have at some point, if they're very old at all, have something like that. So does that mean that we're not going to hire those people? No, of course not. Um, but you have to consider, well, what are the offenses that cross the line and make this person inappropriate. For example, if, if you are, uh, if you have a, uh, if you're a truck driving company, you probably don't want to have people who have a DWI convictions. But if you are hiring a secretary, do you really care whether he or she is a DWI conviction? Probably not so much. And so many times, what is important in terms of the background check may vary depending upon the position. Um, and so um, those are important things to think about. Lots of issues you have to think through in this area. Um, the EOC um, has guidance uh, in this area that is worthy of, of looking at, but when you study it, I think it's also helpful to recognize that courts have not always followed the EOC's guidance in this area. The EOC recognizes a fact that is undoubtedly true, which is that our criminal justice system has in many very fundamental ways discriminated against uh, people who are not white much more likely that African Americans and Hispanic Americans um, have been incarcerated and convicted of crimes um, over many, many years and even to this day. And so what the EOC says is, well, to consider those crimes could have a disparate impact upon minority groups and also upon men uh, because they are more likely to be convicted of those crimes. Um, and so the EOC is reluctant to allow employers to use those unless there's a very clear connection between the job and the conviction. Now, I think courts have usually been more willing to give employers some latitude in this area. So uh, the EOC's position is perhaps a little bit extreme, but still it's useful to be aware of that and to be aware of the fact that there is this history of uh, racial discrimination in our criminal justice system. Sometimes employers want to use arrest records. And this is a really, really bad idea because the arrest records are even more likely to be, to have a disparate impact upon uh, minority groups. And uh, so it's something you want to stay clear of. Obviously, if you have an arrest without a conviction, there hasn't been a trial, there's been no conviction. And so therefore, uh, the strength of the evidence was obviously not there to begin with. And so except in perhaps a, a, a very few set of um, uh, security clearance positions um, or, or uh, uh, maybe a handful of other situations, arrest records just really should be ignored. And I would say it's a better practice for the employer not to even know about the arrest records, at least the arrest records that didn't result in a conviction. Let's consider a scenario. So we have a business here. It employs three temporary workers. It doesn't complete background checks. One of these workers, unfortunately, has been convicted of rape. He's just out of prison. So if the painting company had done a background check on Joe, it would have found out that, yes, he is not safe. Uh, Joe, while uh, painting uh, a house, attacks and rapes the owner of the house that's being painted. The victim obviously can sue Joe, but let's face it, Joe's not going to have any money. He's just got out of prison. 
uh, the victim can also sue Bob's painting company for the lack of the background check. Now, if Bob's painting company had done the background check, and let's say the background check just hadn't shown Joe's conviction, and when Bob had asked Joe, Joe hadn't volunteered the information, maybe he had an explanation regarding the gap of employment, or maybe he just told a lie, and uh, Bob tried to confirm the information, and no red flags went off. If Bob had done the due diligence, even though, of course, this is a terrible thing that happened to this homeowner, Bob would be in a much better position to perhaps avoid um, uh, some liability. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, what about respondeat superior or vicarious liability? Well, that wouldn't apply in this situation because obviously, let me go back here to our list here. Ah, here we go, is that Joe committing a rape was obviously not serving even partially the interests of the employer. So the respondeat superior argument is not going to help the victim of the crime um, in, its, in his or her efforts to uh, get Bob's painting service to be liable. But the negligent hiring situation could be a, a mechanism. Let's consider the situation of, of Eager Beaver Bank. It employs Bob, who's been arrested four times. Okay, we're not really going to consider the arrest, though. But he has been convicted twice of fraud as a bank teller. So he's hired as a bank teller, but he's got these two fraud convictions. Well, Bob hasn't stopped committing fraud, unfortunately, for Eager Beaver Bank. He consistently underpays uh, customers making large withdrawals. He pockets a little bit of the money, I guess, each time, and he keeps the money for himself. When a customer attempts to recover her lost funds from Bob, she discovers, hey, Bob's left. And so under those circumstances, yes, the bank is going to be responsible for the customer because of negligent hiring, probably also on a respondeat superior basis. See here, we've kind of talked a lot about criminal background checks already. We've already talked about the fact you need to distinguish between arrests and convictions. We care about convictions, we don't care about arrests. Uh, criminal records are very decentralized, they can be inaccurate, they can be hard to find. Um, so, those are all problems with our system as it exists today. We already talked about the fact that African Americans and Latinos are arrested and convicted at much higher rates than whites, and so therefore there is a disparate impact to using criminal convictions. Um, we talked about the matrices. Matri uh, the matrix is a system where you list the various types of crimes and then you consider the various positions that you have. And so there may be some positions that it's fine to be convicted of that crime, other positions in your organizations, it's not fine to be convicted of that crime. Credit reports. The Fair Credit, uh, Fair Credit Reporting Act, uh, um, a FICRA, is um, also relevant to criminal background checks. So FICRA applies to criminal background checks as well as credit reports. Um, and in fact, uh, 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 in some senses, a criminal background check is like a credit report. So what is FICRA, F-R-C-A? It's the major federal law regulating the gathering, sharing, and use of information by employers and consumer reporting agencies. Um, we won't talk about this. So a prospective employer must obtain from the applicant or must disclose to the applicant that a credit report will be obtained and must get the applicant's approval in writing in a standalone authorization before it can actually get the report. Um, and if the employer gets the report and decides not to hire the applicant or to terminate the applicant if the applicant has already been hired, then the employer has to notify the employer. And this um, application or this notification occurs whether it's a credit report that has uh, turned, some, turned up something that the employer isn't interested in or the criminal background check. As I said before, that counts for this purpose under FICRA. Um, 
so in this situation, you actually have to tell the unsuccessful applicant exactly why you decided not to hire them. Something like, well, we see that you've been convicted of this crime or that crime. The reason that you have to reveal that information is because it's not that unusual, unfortunately, for credit reports to be inaccurate. I'll give you an example. This is somewhat dated, but my dad, uh, his name is not tremendously common, but there happened to be another person, and my parents were living in Dallas County at the time, there happened to be another person with my, with, with my dad's first name, same middle initial, same spelling of last name. That man had filed for bankruptcy. My father had not. But because of the fact they were both living in the same county with somewhat not that common of a names. Um, many times the records of the two individuals were confused. And so you can imagine if my dad had applied for a loan or for a job, and when they were doing the background check, if this other person's records had popped up showing that he had filed for a recent bankruptcy, that could have undermined my, my dad's efforts. And so it would be useful for my father to know, oh, wait a second. No, 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 that's not me. That's that other guy. And let me prove to you it's not me. And and uh, so that could correct that record. Now, is the employer required to wait and give the, that potential employee the opportunity to make the correction? No. Most likely the employer will have gone ahead and hired somebody else. It's too late to correct it, even if there really is a complete mistake on the part of the credit agency. But at least lets the employee know, or the potential applicant, I guess we should say, know what was going on, perhaps clear up the record for future occasions. And I guess it's possible that there might be some future opportunity with that particular employer. Now, if, you don't, if you're not complying with FICRA, though, it's best to give a politely worded but vague statement as to why you're not going to hire the person. Something like, thank you for your application. We appreciate, you know, the time and effort that you spent. Um, uh, you know, you know, you, you were not the best fit for the job. We had so many qualified applicants, da 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 da, da. You want to make the person feel good about it, but you don't want to give any specifics. And it's good just to have, like, except in the FICRA compliance area, just a standard letter that you send out almost verbatim to every unsuccessful candidate. You know, that raises another point, and that is when you have a situation where you have decided to hire Bob, and yet you have several other candidates that you weren't going to hire, it is a best practice to communicate with them, to let them know that they are no longer being considered and to send that polite note. It's becoming less and less common that employers do that, but as you function in the legal and HR world, I hope that you will continue that practice uh, of, of sending out the letters. It can be a good way, way of, of uh, providing goodwill because these might be future employees of yours. They may reapply at some point or they may be customers. And, you know, it's kind of just the right thing to do too. If, as a result, the employer intends to take adverse action, it must notify the employee with a pre-adverse action disclosure so the person may explain or refute the negative information. After taking adverse action based upon a credit report, the um, em employer must give the person an adverse action letter. Ten states limit the use of credit reports in the employer's hiring process. Texas is not yet one of those states. Of course, that could change. Um, there aren't, uh, Texas doesn't have any limitation on the use of credit reports or criminal background. As we talked before, that um, guidelines that the OC has given would tend to limit um, the use of criminal background checks, or at least the OC is going to look at those very carefully if a charge is filed. Okay, let's consider the reference area. Um, Fair to check at least recent references can be evidence of negligent hiring. Uh, so even if you check the references or you know when you start the process of checking, you're not going to get anything, it's better to dot the I and cross the T and to document that behavior so that you can actually say, hey, you know what? We had no way of knowing Bob was fired from the job. We called them and they wouldn't tell us anything. So Bob told us he quit, he quit and we took him at his word because we didn't have any other information. If you hadn't made the call, though, you couldn't say what you would have heard. Um, and so it's a, it, even when you get no information in some sense, it's still good information for your purposes. 
We talked about compelled self-publication before in the Vermont case, um, and this arises, uh, this is a defamation situation. It arises when an employer fires somebody for an unlawful reason. Uh, or it's not so much an unlawful reason, but uh, a fire somebody, for, uh, not so much for an unlawful reason, but uh, because they uh, have a misunderstanding of the facts. So the employer fires me for theft. Probably that's not unlawful for the employer to do so unless the employer is discriminating against me in some respect. In other words, assuming I'm the thief because I happen to belong to this ethnic or racial or gender group. Um, but you know, the employer happens to be wrong in this case, and maybe the employer should have known better. Um, but the employer isn't telling anybody else about it, so it is not engaging in publication. And of course, in order to have a defamation, there has to be publication. Well, because I'm fired, I'm looking for another job, so I put out my resume, I go to job interviews, and invariably I'm asked, well, what happened? Why aren't you still working at that other place? So now I'm required to publicize the defamation. So I say to them, well, you know, the reason that I'm not at that place of employment is that my employer fired me for theft, and I'm innocent of that, but that's the reason they gave. Well, of course, the employer is going to say, or not really say, but think to itself, well, maybe she committed the theft, maybe she didn't. But the one thing I'm sure about is I don't want to take the risk. And so if there is somebody else who's qualified, I'm not picking her, I'm picking that person. And so you can see in this situation, the employer never publicized the defamation, but they created a situation in which the person being defamed is actually kind of being forced to publish publish it himself. So here's the definition for compelled self-publication. It occurs when an ex-employee is forced to repeat the reason for his or her termination and thereby has a basis for a claim of defamation. I'm not aware of any cases in Texas where compelled self-publication has been used as the only basis for publication and the uh, former employee has won. There are states where that has been successful. I'm not sure that it would be successful in Texas, but it certainly would be an interesting area. But whether it would or wouldn't be successful in Texas, uh, there is that possibility as an employer. So you have to be aware that, you know, th in the very least you could face a lawsuit in this area. So you wanna be careful about how you provide explanations. As a result, employers oftentimes don't fire people for theft or things along those lines. A common thing that you'll see employers do is say um, that the employee is being terminated for violation of company procedures. Well, one of the procedures that the company has is don't steal from us. So um, when you say that the employee was was, viola uh, was dismissed for a violation of company procedures, um, usually in a theft situation, probably the employee did violate some procedure, just didn't maybe steal. Maybe that's the debatable part. And so if you can have something that is just a clear cut that the employee actually didn't follow every procedure, didn't dot every I, didn't cross every T, then the chances of getting a defamation claim are reduced. I once dealt with a high-ranking HR manager who said, we want to call a spade a spade. If the person stole from us, we want to use the code that's saying they stole from us. Now, I can see the argument. We want uh, to be clear about your communication, but you are still possibly creating a claim if it ends up that you can't fully, fully prove the theft situation. Or maybe you could prove it at one point, but now the evidence has been destroyed and it's much more difficult to prove. So the question is, what is the employer gaining by using this terminology? Because certainly the employer is, is accepting some legal risk that wasn't already present. Let's consider this scenario. Bob was fired for allegedly stealing at work, but he's denying he he stole. So he's denying it, but he's still fired for it. Um, he applies to work at another business. He isn't successful because he's asked, hey, why were you terminated? And Bob has to say, well, you know, I mean, they thought I stole, but I didn't. But of course, the, the next employer doesn't believe Bob, or at least has a question mark about Bob. Under those circumstances, if this jurisdiction accepts a defamation claim with compelled self-publication, Bob could have a good claim against the former employer. 
We talked about after acquired ev evidence before. This is when, during the lawsuit, the employer finds out some goodies about the plaintiff, things that the uh, employer did not already know and therefore couldn't have been factors in the earlier decision. Things that if the employer had known earlier might have caused the employer either never to hire the employee or to terminate the employee earlier on. But of course, because this information is acquired later on, it wasn't a factor in the actual decision the employer took. We call this after acquired evidence. Now the way the law approaches this is kind of a split the baby method. It allows the employer to get some credit for of the evidence, but not complete credit for the information. Let's see how um, it's been defined here. Admissible evidence that is acquired by the employer after it has made the relevant decision. So that's a definition. This evidence, though unknown at the time, actually supports the employer's decision. So the way that it plays out is whatever date that the employer actually gets that information, if the employer can prove that that evidence would have a rightfully cause the employer to make the same decision that it made earlier on, then that's going to cut off damages at that point. From that date forward, the employee isn't going to be eligible for damages. But the employee is potentially going to be eligible for damages from the date the employer made the actual decision until that evidence is disclosed if the jury buys that the employer didn't have enough evidence at that time to support the decision. So it's going to reduce the amount of damages that the successful plaintiff can get if the employer is successful at proving that the after acquired evidence, what number one is admissible, and number two, right, rightfully would have caused the employer to make that particular decision. So it's kind of a complicated analysis from that standpoint. We talked about definition before, but this typically arises when um, references are checked, um, the employer is asked to describe how this person was at work or at the time of a termination. This can also arise when the employer is um, asked or th there's questions in the workplace about, well, why isn't Bob here anymore? Uh, you know, uh, hey, hey, Sally, supervisor, tell us why Bob's not here. And Sally starts saying, well, let me tell you what happened. Uh, kind of human nature may be to engage in a little bit of gossip, but better to say, uh, Bob's no longer in our employee. Let's get back to work and kind of leave it at that. Uh, so if, if you don't make any statements about something, you can't possibly defame somebody. Now, obviously, defamation has to be false. So if you're saying true things, you know you're going to be safe. But keep in mind, uh, people's recollection changes. A jury sometimes believe the wrong people. And so even though you're saying things that are truthful, it doesn't mean that somehow or another uh, the jury somehow will be able to put the, the, the truth lance around somebody and, and be able to ferret truths from lies necessarily. So better not to say anything when it doesn't really benefit the company to be speaking at this point. And again, here are the elements for defamation. You see the publication requirement here. And let's look at the defenses to defamation. One is consent. Another is qualified privilege. And the third is truth. Now, truth really isn't a defense to defamation because as we go back here, you'll see that one of the elements of defamation, one of the things that the plaintiff has to prove is number two, the statement was false or substantially false. Um, so this isn't a defense. This is something that's part of the case in chief of the the plaintiff. So it's a little misleading to call that a, 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 tr a, a defense. But it is something that if it is true, the plaintiff can't win. So if the statement is true, it is not defamatory, even if it hurts a reputation. I mean, the truth hurts sometimes. If, going back to this story, Bob actually did steal at work, it doesn't matter whether he had